Hello, we are the Association for Child and Adolescent Mental Health, or ACAM for short. The second announcement is going to be shorter. It's going to be about our first speaker, who is, and we got, in German speaking world, they have this thing where they say how many times you're a doctor, how many times you're a professor, and so, so. I think you're just the one doctor, one professor, or are you one? So he's <laughs> Professor Doctor Christian Schwab. He's, he's based uh, in Mannheim, which, um, for those who haven't come across this before, is like the equivalent of the Institute of Psychiatry, but in Germany. So this is where they forge all of the scientists and researchers who are looking to mental health. And uh, one thing I wanted to say to you about him, which is serious, is that he has started um, a new center for self-harm, personality disorders, and trauma for adolescents, but interestingly in line with what many of us are thinking about. That spans young people and, and uh, also younger adults. Uh, so his research now spans um, into young people and, and adults too. And one fun thing about Christian is that um, he uh, cycles to work every day for an hour and apparently when he does this he almost always beats all of his colleagues who take cars which gives an immense pleasure <laughs> <laughs> all right so without further ado as they say allow me to give you professor dr christian schmal <clears throat> Very frequent in LS. 
lessons, as I mentioned, between 40 and 60 years. And the question I um, personally think is very important is what happens with those young people that cut themselves or hurt themselves and those that stop and those that don't stop. And I think that some of them that don't stop NSSI after the lessons end up as online personality disorder. So this is the background for the neurobiological work um, I will show you today, because we can use borderline personality disorder as a model disorder to study the mechanisms behind self-injury. And my talk will tackle three domains. Emotion <coughs> dysregulation is at the heart of borderline personality disorder and also closely related to disturbed pain processing. I will talk a lot about emotion dysregulation and pain processing. At the end, I will um, have a brief section on social interaction, what is disturbing social interaction, and how this is related to pain and emotion dysregulation in borderline people. So let's start with the uh, NSSI in borderline personality disorder. We started the research in that field with, with asking the patients, what are your motives for self-injury? And by far the most frequent motives are to reduce stress or tension levels. That's a you see that nearly 100% of borderline uh, patients mention that as their primary motive for NSSI, uh, um, and also related to a re reduction of unpleasant feelings. So emotion regulation is at the center of uh, NSSI motives. There is another group that is related to dissociative symptoms. A lot of these patients show dissociation, depersonalization, derealization. And often NSSI in these uh, young people is used to reduce these dissociation symptoms. So a motive can be, for example, to regain the awareness of physical sensation. This is also a very frequent motive. Recently, we uh, moved on uh, to assess psychometrics with um, ecological momentary assessment, EMA or ambulatory assessment. You probably are familiar with that. We can now use these handhelds to assess the questionnaires that we used to um, have as a paper pencil version. We have that now on the smartphones. And the advantage of that is that we can assess the symptoms and also some biological data uh, in everyday life. So these smartphones beep every hour, every other hour, and it asks for what the people have done, where they, be, where they are, what they, if they have hurt themselves, for example. So you can assess the self-injury in real life. And of course, you can also use that um, um, to, for interventions. Then this is called an EMI, ecological momentary intervention. That is also a relatively new field. And there are different assessments. Uh, for example, you can have random prompts, so this thing beeps every other hour, or event-based prompts. That's what we are doing. So once an individual has uh, hurt her or himself, um, they have to answer certain questions. I will show you what we did with that. But before that, let me um, show you some older data where these, uh, that was before the smartphone era, but we had these handheld PCs that were carried around um, over 48 hours. And you see here, uh, in the first glance, that the high level of tension or stress levels in borderline patients compared to controls, this is a very uh, significant marker of the, uh, of the borderline personality disorder. And what is even more interesting, if you look at the fluctuations, you can use these um, assessments every hour and look at the fluctuations from hour to hour. For example, here this, this nice study found uh, um, that the affective instability can be um, shown here by changing levels from green, which is a very good mood, to very bad mood. And you see this high fluctuating states as compared to healthy controls. The healthy controls are mostly in the green era, area, and the borderline patients are fluctuating a lot. So this is a marker of affective instability. When you look at changes in emotions before and after NSSI, there's an interesting recent study that showed uh, or that assessed negative and positive emotions before and after NSSI events in real life. And in the left side, you see the negative emotions, sadness, angry, um, feelings of um, hurt, being hurt or frustrated. And on the right, you see the positive emotions, content, proud, feeling relieved, and so on. And what is a bit scary, actually, is that all the negative emotions um, 
um, get better after uh, self-injury, so it's a reduction of negative emotions, and the positive emotions <coughs> all get stronger. So they feel more happy, more content, more relieved. So you see that the strong moment of reinforcement of NSSI um, that can be measured in everyday life. So now we're coming back to our EMA study that has been recently um, finished. So the data are not published yet. And um, what we did here is we studied young adolescents and adults between the age of 15 and 25 in everyday life that carried these smartphones that had the random rods. So every second hour it beeped and we assessed emotions, we assessed dissociation with a scale called DSS. We, and we also assess interpersonal <coughs> events. So we asked them, what did you do before the last meeting? With whom were you together? What did you do? And then we had this so-called self-initiated prompts that were these prompts that were carried out after an NSSI act. So the participants were instructed, once they had cut or hurt themselves, to answer questions and to, uh, to mark that on their smartphones. And we assessed the same uh, questions, emotions, dissociation, or the interpersonal events. So we could study what happened in terms of emotions, but also in terms of uh, what changed in their interpersonal life uh, before and after self-injury. And, and another thing you can co uh, combine that with is to assess certain biological data. What we did, we assessed saliva samples and uh, looked for, um, for, the, uh, for the opioid system. So we assessed endogenous opioids that are produced in the body uh, that are related to pain uh, before and after self injury. So I will show you only a few of these um, data from this study. So here is the, uh, the first data for the effect and the stress level. So here negative effect, uh, and you see um, the LSSI condition and the control condition. And I forgot to mention that the, um, with this design you can compare uh, uh, prompts after NSSI with prompts or before and after uh, conditions where you had similarly high stress levels but without NSSI. So you have a, a possibility to compare states of high stress in one um, with one uh, followed by a self injury and one without a self injury. So we have a control condition, right? So here you see that we have st um, situations with high levels of negative effect and, and stress. And then you have the control condition where there is no NSSI event, and then you have an, the same sim a similar situation of high stress followed by NSSI. And you see that negative effect and um, tension is lower when uh, NSSI has been carried out. So com this confirms the, uh, the older study that NSSI leads to a reduction of negative effect and tension levels. Now coming to the biological data, which is um, I think the first one that has come compared endogenous um, opioids in um, relation to real NSSI events in everyday life. How are these things related? The endogenous opioid system is a relatively complex system. There are different classes of opioids, most importantly, and what we studies are the beta endorphins that are important for uh, re regulating of pain. Beta endorphins downregulate pain, not only a physical pain, but also social and emotional pain. Um, and um, are related, of course, to positive reinforcement. So the question was, can the disturbance of beta endorphins be related to NSSI? Because, of course, uh, the endogenous opioid system is related to pain, as I mentioned. So the question was, how is it related to non-suicidal self-injury? What did we do uh, in this study? Um, this was done all over Germany, and um, uh, you see we assessed uh, individuals in different places, and uh, it was a relatively complex design, so they had to uh, for, um, uh, have a little bit of a uh, saliva sample here, and that were collected, and then sent all to Mannheim, and analyzed them in, actually in Ulm, uh, in the lab that uh, does the saliva op opioid assessment. What we found is that there is a difference between shortly before and after um, self-injury in terms of endorphin levels. So they actually increase um, after NSSI. Before NSSI, they are relatively low, and after NSSI, they get back to normal levels. So it seems that um, 
there is a depletion of endorphins in uh, before NSSI, and through uh, self injury, and, um, endorphin levels go back to normal levels. This might be an, another um, important factor to explain the mechanism and to explain the reinforcement of NSSI. That is a, a hypothesis that, that has been put forward, but um, we could demonstrate that it's really the case in everyday life that beta endorphin levels can be increased through self injury. And finally, we, um, I show you some of the findings in relation to interpersonal events. So we actually assessed negative and positive events before and after NSSI. Here you see the uh, negative events. We assess, for example, someone criticized me, I was rejected, I was ignored. The positive events, just examples, someone supported me, showed me affection. And as you can see, um, the, um, there were relatively more negative events in, in, in general um, than positive events in the life but the interesting thing is what happened after uh, self-injury. So we looked at the difference between before and after self-injury, and we had three hypotheses. Actually, um, our first hypothesis was that negative interpersonal events predict high probability of NSSI. So uh, if I had had a bad experience, a negative event, then the probability to hurt myself is higher, and that's could be confirmed, that's indeed the case. Um, our second hypothesis was related to reinforcement. So uh, there's something um, called negative social reinforcement. So um, meaning that uh, the hypothesis was that NSSI reduces the probability of negative social events. So there is a there has been hypothesized that um, when you um, hurt yourself, negative social events become less important or you can avoid, for example, negative social events, negative social encounters and so on, but this could not be confirmed. This was not the case and, and the third hypothesis was related to positive reinforcement. So the question was, does NSSI increase the probability of positive social events that I just mentioned? So I get affection, I, uh, people take care of me and that could also not be confirmed. So we could not confirm these two social reinforcement hypothesis, but we could confirm the hypothesis that of a prediction, so that negative person, interpersonal events indeed predict high probability of NSSI. So now this was all not really in neurobiology so far, and now you probably wait for the brain, and this now, <laughs> now we're coming to the brain. Um, so what, first, before we talk about pain, uh, we need to talk about emotion regulation, and just in a nutshell, what is going on in the brain of a borderline in a patient that is self-injurious? Um, what is important here? A few facts. Uh, one is that, of course, the, uh, the important brain region we are talking about here is the amygdala, here in red. The amygdala is in our emotional center of, of our brains, and for example, if we show these pictures, like these negative pictures from the International Affective Picture System, usually the amygdala is overactive in, in most people. And second, the amygdala is under strong control from the prefrontal cortex. You can see here the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex has two pathways, how it regulates the amygdala. One is through the cingulate cortex, that's the more dorsal pathway here, and there's a ventral pathway to the orbitofrontal cortex. So amygdala is activated by negative stimuli and is under strong prefrontal control. And what we could show in a meta-analysis that has been recently published is that people with uh, trauma-related disorders such as PTSD and borderline PD have overactive amygdala when you show these pictures. That's um, diff different from major depression where we have a rather hypoactive amygdala. So in these trauma and stress-related disorders, the amygdala is overactive and we assume that this regulating pathway from the prefrontal cortex is not functioning well. Okay, so that's the background for that. So remember that the amygdala is overactive because now we come to pain and here the picture is very different. And that's interesting because we are interested in why do people cut or hurt themselves? So why do you afflict pain on your own body, which is somehow non, not logical. So, but we try to um, solve this puzzle a bit and uh, I'll show you in the next few minutes. 
So we started this research, um, as already mentioned, very long ago, <laughs> nearly 20 years ago. We did um, studies on pain processing in borderline personality disorder. In the old days, we used the cold presser test. This is a very simple test. You uh, take a bucket of ice cold water, put your hand in there, and then you would just simply ask the participant how painful is that. And the, that you can see here, you ask painfulness on a scale from zero to seven, and we had here normal, healthy women between 20 and 30 years old, and you see it's pretty painful. So it goes, it goes up nearly to the highest painfulness. Then we had four line patients here, that's in red, this line, and you see how reduced painfulness is here. It only goes up to a level of two. And the more interesting is the same patients were studied here again, that's the green line. The same patients were asked to come to the lab and to the cold presser test when they were in a high level of stress, when they were just about to cut themselves. And you see again another, this is still significant, this, uh, significant reduction um, of painfulness under stress. The same could be confirmed in a, in, a, in a second study where we assess pain not with water, but with, um, with electric stimulation. So we use all kinds of uh, painful torture methods. So one of them is uh, uh, electric pain, pain thresholds. Um, you, you increase the level of, um, of um, current and then and you ask what, where is the pain threshold, so when does it uh, when do you feel pain and you see the higher the arousal or the stress level, the higher the pain threshold. That's exactly the same. Um, so you can correlate individual arousal with painfulness. Interestingly, um, the um, painfulness and the cortisol system are closely related and in, um, <coughs> in Heidelberg and Mr. Kess and colleagues did studies on the triosocial stress test. So if you um, afflict social pain, the triosocial stress test is a social pain, uh, stimulation where you sit in front of an audience, you have to perform, you have to make a, 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 a presentation in front of an audience, which is a social stress, and you can see that normally the uh, cortisol levels as a marker of social stress go up, but in, there's a blunting of this social stress response of cortisol in an NSSI group, so nearly no reaction of cortisol. Interestingly here, and again, here you see how pain, is, pain uh, processing is disturbed in NSSI, the opposite is the case if you afflict pain. Then cortisol is rising more than in control. So NSSI subjects, although they feel less pain, have a stronger rise of cortisol levels. So you, there's again a um, disturbance of the pain stress axis, as you can see here. And um, this fact of reduced pain sensitivity that we studied in different, with different methods has been recently found or uh, confirmed in a meta-analysis, also by the Heidelberg group, Milan yeah. Koenig, nicely demonstrated that um, if you look at different studies all across the board, you hear our, our, our own borderline studies, there are other studies that study pain sensitivity in youth with NSSI without any formal disorder, that all over the board, it's a reduction of pain sensitivity. So this is a, you can say it's a fact now, and has been confirmed in the meta-analysis, that pain sensitivity is reduced in those that uh, hurt themselves. So now coming back again to the brain, another of our pain methods is now heat pain, which is ideal to study during fMRI. You can't ca carry the ice bucket water in the fMRI scanner, so you need a more sophisticated method here. And what we did is this uh, thermal induced pain, this is placed on the back of, of your hand and it's heated up to, uh, to temperatures between 40 and 48 degrees. Celsius, and here again, this is not now it's not new for you anymore. Uh, in borderline patients here in red, you see the reduction of pain sensitivity. Uh, let's take the temperature, for example, 46 degrees that we applied in, in healthy women. It's pretty painful here. You see a 6% painfulness in borderline patients. With, uh, they are all frequent cutters. So all these borderline patients we studied here in this study had at least one NSSI event per week and they have a reduction of pain sensitivity. This is not new, what it, but now the more important effect is, if you remember the elevated amygdala activity that is normal in these patients, here with the pain simulation, we see the opposite again. When we afflict pain, normally in healthy, it increases the amygdala because it's an aversive stimulus. In the borderline patients, it's the opposite. It's a decrease of amygdala activity, and not only amygdala, but also other 
effective brain regions such as the anterior cingulate cortex. Interestingly, one of the control regions that controls pain, the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex is overactive. So there is an over control of the amygdala, which leads to a dampening. And this is a hint that something is completely wrong here and that uh, the amygdala is decreased through painful stimuli. And maybe also, again, reinforcing the uh, mechanism here. Then we went a little bit deeper in, into, into the system. We combined these two mechanisms. So we first tried to increase the amygdala activation by these pictures and then added uh, the pain. So to mimic somehow this self-injury or the, the mechanism of self-injury. Of course, it's not self-injury here because uh, the pain is afflicted by the machine or by the investigator, right? I come to that later, we, um, how you can disentangle that. But here it's still simply pain. Uh, but what we can see is, again, the amygdala is overactive. That's the borderline patients here uh, in this circle. So uh, in the face where we only show the pictures, there is an overactive amygdala. And again, oops. After adding pain here, the amygdala goes back to normal levels. So again, uh, demonstrating that uh, pain can be used to dampening the overactive amygdala. The next step was um, to look at the impact of tissue injury. Um, we tried to understand the mechanism of self-injury from different angles. And of course, the first and most important is pain. Second is tissue damage or tissue injury. So in self-injury, it's, it's, as I mentioned, the DSM um, definition is damage of the body surface. So usually cutting. So why people use cutting? So we used a pain model, it's called incision. Incision means we do a little damage to the skin. Um, that's how it's done, it's done with a scalpel. Um, it's a four millimeter wide um, incision. It's very, I mean, it's, it's nothing compared to the real uh, self-injury, which is often uh, 10 centimeters or so. It's very short, but it's, it's uh, dis uh, little destruction of the skin. It's comparable to a venipuncture um, in terms of uh, the size and also of the painfulness. But interestingly, uh, we combined it with a, a stress induction, that's the Montreal Imaging Stress Task. Maybe you have seen that. It's forced um, arithmetics uh, un um, under time pressure. You are told that you're too slow, and it's a very nasty task because the, the better you get, the more difficult the, uh, the, the arithmetics get, and you are there's also a social component in here, like in the trial social stress task. You are told that you are in the right, uh, here in the red um, area and that your, um, the other participants in the study managed to go to the green level, but you will never make it there. You are always held in the red part. So it's really stressful and you can see it works here. We can really use stress here. It's online patients, healthy controls. They all get stressed. But the difference comes later when we add this incision after the stress induction, the borderline patients go down and the healthies go further up. Again, there's an opposite direction of the uh, stress levels here. And um, we did that in the scanner. You could do that in the scanner. And uh, again, the amygdala uh, here in the borderline patients, the reds are the borderline patients, goes down. So the amygdala activity is dampening after this incision while it is uh, increased in healthy controls. But we really wanted to understand, is it really the tissue injury or is it simply pain? So we needed this paradigm in, in a direct comparison of these two paradigms. And that, that's what we did here. We compared the incision with the scalpel with another, uh, now another um, method of, of uh, painfulness, uh, pain induction, which is called blade. It's, um, it's also, it's a pressure pain, but it doesn't destroy the skin. It's the same painfulness. These two instruments are, have the same painfulness, but they, uh, the only difference is that this is um, destruction of the skin and this is not, okay? And um, we, uh, actually we, we thought that the incision is more potent in, in stress reduction because we, we, we thought that tissue injury is an important factor, but we could not demonstrate that. Interestingly, both incision and blade led to a similar decrease of stress levels. You can see here, that's the blade, the dotted line, and the solid line is the incision. They, it's exactly the same reduction of uh, um, SAM ratings are stress levels, so the stress reduction is the same. So this was 
contrary to our hypothesis, no influence of tissue injuries. It's the simple effect of pain. The last factor is, or actually the two uh, um, last factors besides um, tissue injury is the role of seeing blood. So why often, uh, why is it so important to see your own blood flow? And, this, and the last one is again, <coughs> as I already mentioned, the perspective. So is it important that you inflict the pain yourself, like in, in self-injury, or is it also working if something else is doing that? So we did that in two by two design. We had a um, use our blade and combine it with a uh, artificial blood. So it's uh, blood that is used in movies or in theaters. It's, it uh, has the same temperature, the same consistency, and the same color as real blood. Um, but it's artificial blood. And we combine that with a blade, and we have two conditions of the pain infliction, either self-inflicted or other inflicted. You can put this instrument yourself on your skin. It uh, can't cause any harm. So we really con con can compare the same painfulness, either self or other inflicted, and with and without blood. So let me first show you the effects of seeing blood. There's no difference in, in painfulness. That's nice to see, but the important thing is here in terms of heart rate, and we had the same in terms of subjective uh, uh, stress levels. There is an initial decrease that is stronger. This is a decrease of stress levels again. So going down means decrease. And the decrease is stronger when blood is added. Although the painfulness is the same, a significantly stronger decrease just by simply having this red color uh, running over your skin. And interestingly, it's very short lasting. It's only the first few minutes after half an hour this thing is gone. So and this is um, closely related to uh, the, the clinical experience that the patients say, okay, once I see the blood flowing over my arm, I feel relieved. And this is an immediate and a very strong effect, okay? Then finally, the uh, effect of uh, author or um, of self versus other. Um, and the, here the results are a bit mixed. So in terms of um, heart rate directly after the stimulus, immediately after the stimulus, there's a stronger decrease when it's inflicted by others. 3.5 minutes or a little bit later, it, it seems to turn around. So it's not really clear yet. So we are not sure what to make out of that, of this dual um, effects here. So the role of doing it yourself or someone else is inflicting pain is a little bit unclear yet. So let me sum all this, uh, <coughs> this, this line of research, let me sum that up. So we could demonstrate in a now in confirmed meta-analytically there is a clear finding of reduced pain sensitivity related to NSSI. Um, pain leads to a reduction of stress and also of amygdala activity that's also relatively clear. Um, it seems to be the case that it's not so important that the skin is uh, destroyed by uh, the, um, in, in this mechanism. Um, there is, a, at least we have two studies now with uh, the effect of seeing blood that could be confirmed, but only by our group. So I would be happy to collaborate with anyone that is using similar methods. We need much more uh, of this research. There are only a few groups worldwide that do that. And of course, uh, Paul in Vienna and you doing uh, pain research here, which is really important um, to increase uh, the number of studies and also to, to confirm that not only by the same lab, but by others, that's really important. So that's why it's in brackets here, because we only could confirm it ourselves. Uh, the, as I mentioned at the end, the role of the perspective, so whether I inflict pain on myself, is that the important factor we cannot say yet? Okay, so that was the story of the mechanism of NSSI in relation to emotion regulation, now coming to social interaction, a little bit different topic. Um, how is that related? Uh, we now know that social pain is related to physical pain. Um, it feels similarly and it is related to the same brain regions. So social pain, like social exclusion, leads to an um, increase or an, an activation of brain regions that is very similar to actual physical pain. And how, you, how do you um, induce social pain? It's usually done uh, by, by this paradigm called cyberball. You probably have seen or heard about that. It's um, a paradigm where you are told that you are playing a ball game with two other people and you are told that this is your hand. For example, you can do 
uh, in the instruction that you are lying in a MR scanner and you are playing with two other people that are lying in different scanners in another country or so. And you have a two conditions. You have an inclusion condition where you are allowed to play with them and you are, there is an exclusion condition uh, where only these two guys are playing with each other and you don't get the ball. That's the exclusion condition. And it's very potent. You can see here exclusion, the exclusion condition leads to increase of feeling exclusion very strongly. So it really does what it is supposed to do. And what we looked at is two borderline patients, or that also have, uh, they all had NSSI as well here. Um, how do they behave in the inclusion exclusion condition? Not surprisingly, both groups uh, during the exclusion condition they felt excluded. That's not very surprising. The more important thing is that during the inclusion condition there is a difference, and also during a control condition. I forgot to mention the control condition, which is just playing in a clockwise here, uh, round and round. So um, it's a control condition just to um, um, control for, for, um, for the movement of the ball. So in the control and the inclusion condition, the ball line patients had more excluded than the healthy controls, um, and which is also related to clinical knowledge that um, uh, they feel excluded even if they are included, right? That's what a lot of patients tell you. Now coming again to the brain, what happens in the brain here? There are certain brain regions, uh, for example here the mid cingulate cortex, um, which are overactive in the inclusion condition in borderline patients. You can see here the borderline and the healthy controls. The borderline patients show an overactive during the inclusion condition. Again, this is the most important difference. And um, Paul's group uh, could nicely demonstrate that this is specific for, uh, for the NSSI. He compared uh, an NSSI adolescent group with a depressed adolescent group, um, and the, only the NSSI group uh, showed this activation here, not exactly the same region, but in the more frontal region of the dorsal lateral uh, of the medial prefrontal cortex, but also of the ventral lateral prefrontal cortex. So it somehow also seems to be related to NSSI here. And finally, we combine these two things again. So combining the exclusion and inclusion and um, assess pain after uh, this is kind of a stress challenge similar to the other ones I showed you before. So we uh, first did an inclusion <coughs> and an exclusion simulation and then we assessed pain and the brain activation of pain. And since the inclusion is the more potent in showing differences, I only show you here the uh, data for the inclusion condition. So pain after inclusion leads again to an amygdala deactivation, uh, similar to the one I showed you before. Um, not after a control condition where there's only a warm simulation, but after the, uh, after the inclusion in all the patients, in contrast to healthy controls, again, pain leads to deactivation. And interestingly, this is related to uh, something called rejection sensitivity. It's a, it's a questionnaire that assesses rejection sensitivity, and the higher the rejection sensitivity, we have to do the solid line, the lower the amygdala activity. So the more you feel rejected in everyday life, the more your amygdala goes down um, after painful stimulation here. So I showed you how or what is wrong in the brain or in, in the in also in relation to NSSI mechanisms uh, in youth and adolescents with NSSI and borderline personality disorder, which is maybe you could say it's a pretty sad story. But I will, in the end, I will show you some um, things that may be a little bit more optimistic or gives rise to hope, which is related to what happens after remission of borderline personality disorder, which means after they have stopped cutting themselves. And we were in the lucky situation that we had uh, a larger collaborative grant uh, over the last uh, seven or eight years, all studying mechanisms in borderline PD in, in Mannheim and Heidelberg in Germany. And one was we compared patients with ongoing, with um, borderline personality disorder with those that had, had a remission of the disorder. The remission in this case means um, having only three out of nine uh, DSM criteria, and most importantly, who have stopped cutting. So here's a group of current PPD, ongoing NSSI, remitted PPD, meaning having stopped NSSI for at least one year, 
and 22 healthy controls. Again, you know this thermal thing here, heat pain, and you can see nicely <coughs> halfway normalization of pain thresholds. Here's the healthies, you see a lower pain threshold, so they, the good thing here is they feel pain better than the ball lines, and the remitted ones, after having stopped cutting, are halfway back to normal, which is, I think, a good sign. Um, another thing is we uh, looked at the changes of these mechanisms. So um, again, we this is the stress induction with the modular imaging stress induction. And here you can see the urge for NSSI. So here in the, the top, uh, top line is the current ball line. So you see, after stress induction, urge for NSSI goes up. Here in the solid line is the remitted. So there is no difference to healthy controls anymore. So they have stopped cutting, and if you induce stress, the urge for SSI is not increasing anymore, which is also good. And here, this is a bit more complicated. I, I explained what that means. This is the relation between painfulness and stress reduction. So that means, um, is painfulness of the, uh, of the uh, simulation related to, uh, to a, uh, stress reduction. In current uh, BBD, that's this line here, the pain, more painful the stimulus is, the more stress is reduced. So that is why patients with ongoing cutting behavior always increase the amount of painfulness. The cutting is getting deeper and deeper because they need more and more pain. So this is shown here. But this relation is not uh, found anymore in remitted. So there is no relation between painfulness and stress reduction. So this second mechanism, or this relation between painfulness and stress reduction is not found anymore in remitted. And the, here this shows that there is no increase anymore for SSI after stress reduction. So again, a good sign. And here, with, finally, what I want to show you is that after psychotherapy, we find the same in, in an even shorter time. What we do, we have a uh, residential treatment, DBT treatment, three months of in, uh, residential DBT. And what you can see here is painfulness before and after. Here is healthy controls, here is EVD. Here going down means reduced pain sensitivity as compared to healthy. And here you again, you can see tendence, uh, tendency to normalization of painfulness. And what is even more, uh, what I like even more is the change of the amygdala mechanisms. You remember this decrease of amygdala um, in current DPD patients. That's found here again before therapy. So the amygdala is deactivated. And after three months of DPD, you find the normal, the normal amygdala activation. So that means pain is perceived as being stressful or aversive again, which is a good sign in, in, in borderline because that is related to stopping this self injury Right, so you see there's some light on the horizon, so to speak. Um, so this is not, not all hardwired, but in, very important is now, and that's also part of um, the um, STAR consortium that Paul is um, heading, and which I'm lucky to be a part of um, as well, to look at the cause of NSSI and painfulness through the course of adolescence. We have the chance to study young uh, adolescents and adults between the age of 14 and uh, 20, 21, and um, to study their painfulness and also these mechanisms of social exclusion, social inclusion, and emotional regulation over the course of several years, and to see how that develops and what happens when they stop cutting. That's uh, the STAR um, uh, um, paradigm. We study 300 uh, subjects with NSSI, um, adolescents, um, without, they don't need to fulfill any disorders, they just have to have regular NSSI, compare them to healthy controls. We study several genetic endocrine and also psychophysiological markers. We do EMA in everyday life. We study heart rate, heart rate variability, and compare them. And um, the, it's also embedded here is a um, e-treatment, um, an online treatment of NSSI, so we can have a comparison of psychoeducation uh, group and in the subgroup of 60 um, participants with NSSI and 60 healthy controls we also study these fMRI paradigms I showed you this um, pain, uh, pain um, sensitivity social exclusion and emotion regulation in this subgroup. Alright so I 
would like to come to the end and sum it up. So I wanted to show you that we now understand a little bit more about NSSI and how this is related to pain sensitivity. And that's clearly um, uh, a proven fact now that NSSI is related to reduced pain sensitivity. And we have demonstrated that the underlying neural mechanisms mostly related to the amygdala prefrontal axis and how this is disturbed in uh, people that hurt themselves. So there's an amygdala deactivation which is maybe related to a reinforcement of self-injury and this can be changed again. So in remission in patients that um, have remitted or that have been run through a successful psychotherapy, these mechanisms can be back, can go back to normal. And I believe and I hope you agree with me that the better understanding of this correlates is helpful in two ways. It, it helps to improve psychotherapy. We can now, for example, tackle these amygdala mechanisms, for example, with brain stimulation or neurofeedback me uh, methods more precisely. That's one thing. And the second thing is, which I is uh, as uh, important as the first one, is that it helps to destigmatize this behavior. You all know that <coughs> NSSI behavior is also is very much stigmatized and. Um, was long related to attention seeking. Of course, it has these if, um, um, aspects as well, but there's also a very strong biologic component, biologic component behind NSSI. And then my, that's my personal experience that it helps the patients and also their relatives to better understand it uh, and to treat it as a disturbance of the brain as well, besides the, the, all the psychological components. All right, I want to thank um, my co-workers and the collaborators here. These are uh, the people in the group of uh, Inga Liefeld, who is running a lot of these studies on uh, ecological momentary assessment and also on the opioid system and that were actually done here in the lab of Alexander Karabasiakis here in, in Ulm, this lab where Lisa analyzed all these saliva samples, which was quite a, some uh, work uh, recently. And I want to thank you for your attention. To be part of the advancement of child and adolescent mental health, visit www.acamh.org.